Next up, we have the Brassicaceae, which is the mustard or cabbage family, previously called the Cruciferae, and someone made a rule that all of the plant families had to end in A-C-E-A-E, -E, so it became, uh, why they didn't call it the Cruciferaceae, I don't know, but it's now the Brassicaceae. Occasionally, you find Cruciferae in some of the older literature. Characteristics, it's a dicot, so we look for those netted leaf veins, and the flower parts are in fours. Flowers are distinctive with uh, the petals forming a, forming a sort of a cross, and which was the name for the cruciferae name. It was cr supposed to be cross-bearing. The typical plant has a, a basal rosette, which means a bunch of leaves down uh, close to the ground. And then when it blooms, it puts up a flower spike. Many of these are biennials, so they grow the first year and just stick with that flower spike. And then the second year, or maybe late in the first year, they put up that stalk and bloom. So if you think of your uh, broccoli or uh, cabbage, a lot of those types of plants, uh, that's what they do. That's what they're planning to do. We tend to harvest them before they actually go get around to doing it. There are, of course, some variations in there. Some are annuals and some are woodies. The fruit has a unique name called a silique or a silicil, and it may form a loment. I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's the little segments that break off and often then uh, stick to your stock. And characteristic tastes or odors that um, are in this family is due to compounds called glucosinolates that break down into sort of tangy tasting stuff when it's, um, the cells are crushed. And they are insect pollinated, which has a word just for it called entomogony, or entomogonous plants. Here you can see some drawings and a photograph of typical Brassicaceae flowers. The stamens tend to be clustered so that there's four long ones and two short ones. You can see those sort of sticking out of the flowers on the right, the long ones, and you can see the drawing in the upper right. And the petals forming that cross shape that I already mentioned. Now the sleeks and the silicoles, one way to remember which is different is um, a silique is long, as an L is long, and a silicole is, um, tends to be more of a little cute round thing. Along the bottom are a little row of pictures of different kind of silicoles, and the long skinny things on the right are some siliques. You can see to the far right there's a picture of when they finally get ripe and pop open, then they leave that sort of a membrane thing stuck to the plant, and the, the sides of the, the fruiting body sort of pop open and release the seeds. And then you can see the lumpy one, that that's a loment with uh, the seeds are in different little segments. A little taxonomy, they're of course in the kingdom plantae. These are true dicots in the angiosperm clade. Brassicales is the order, and this is the only family in the order. The splitters have been at this uh, family, similar to the Liliaceae. There's about 330 genera left in the family with close to 4,000 species. And cruciferae were, I already mentioned, were um, previously called the cruciferae. Looking at our plant evolutionary tree, we're now on the upper right. You can see the brassicales in the rosid section of uh, plant evolution. Uh, so we've moved up quite a few notches from some of those that we've been looking at the last couple times. And uh, these are definitely getting towards the upper end of plant evolution. Lots of notable species in this family. They're important food plants is in particular. They're widespread in uh, North America. Broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, kale, collard greens. Believe it or not, they're all the same species. They're all Brassica oleracea, oleracea that, um, or maybe oleracea, I don't know, um, that have been um, selected for different uh, features. Also, turnip and Chinese cabbage is Brassica rapa. Canola is Brassica napus. Radish is Raphinus sativus. Horseradish is in this family. Watercress, another um, widely used, not so much in the United States, but elsewhere, Nasturtium officinale. Money plant is um, a horticultural species, Lunaria. And then, unfortunately, garlic mustard is in this group. And Arabidopsis thaliana is a research plant that's quite famous. I will discuss more later. Here are some examples of the different um, Brassica oleracea varieties, all starting from the same plant and uh, domesticated, you know, over hundreds of years so that it's hard to imagine 
that they came from the original plant and that they are actually so similarly related, but they are. The cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, broccoli, and there's several others in that, uh, that category also. Some examples of um, brassicaceae that are edible, horseradish is uh, rather famous. Horseradish, of course, is one of those things you either like or you don't. It's the root which is harvested, mixed with vinegar to uh, make the horseradish prep that you buy in the grocery store. Uh, it's also called sting nose, which I think is probably a really good name for horseradish. I happen to live in uh, near the, actually not near, on the, on the west side of Ankeny, but when they're grinding up the horseradish at the Tones plant on the east side, you can smell uh, that odor very, very, very widely. They've been cultivated for a long time, even, they're even in Greek mythology. Uh, there's a mural of them in Pompeii. And so it's, it's been around a long time, used for a lot of different types of foods. It, peroxidase enzyme is used in biochemistry a lot. So it has actually some research ties also. There's a lot of very routine um, assays and things that are used in uh, biochemistry work that use uh, uh, horseradish peroxidase. There's about 6 million gallons of it produced annually just in the U.S. So that's a lot of horseradish. And believe it or not, Germans put it in their beer. Another edible example is kohlrabi, which is uh, very popular in German, and the name, you can see the translation there, uh, kohl is German for cabbage, and rabi is German for turnip. So um, that's how they're uh, looking at it as a great big turnip, I guess. It originated as much as uh, four or five hundred years ago. There's a lot of different varieties. Some of them are used for cattle, and some are for humans. The leaves are eaten like uh, collards. And it's uh, common in Europe and Kashmir recipes. Extremely wide, widely used research plant, plant is Arabidopsis thaliana. It's um, sort of the research equivalent of mice or fruit flies in laboratories. This is a uh, little European plant turns out to be ideal for researchers. It has a very small genome. It was one of the first, or the first plant genome to be sequenced, and now um, there's just hundreds of mutations have been identified and are uh, used widely in research. It's attractive, in addition to that small genome, it also can complete its entire life cycle from germination to seed set in uh, six weeks under the right conditions, and it's very small, so you can have a lot of them in a laboratory. And at this point in time, there are literally Arabidopsis conferences, there are journals, there are enormously complex websites that, that house all this genetic information that's now known. There are societies for a pretty unassuming little plant that was just grown on some rocks in Europe someplace. I had uh, quite an illustrious career. Some horticultural or an horticultural example of uh, Brassicaceae is the money plant. You've probably seen these in bouquets. Um, they're quite common. They're quite popular in dried uh, flower bouquets. Sometimes they're painted different colors. On the left, you can see it looks like uh, a lot like uh, Dame's Rocket or a lot of the mustards. But when that um, uh, seed pod, that uh, silicol, matures and, uh, and flops open, the, the, what we call the little coin is that center membrane is what's left behind. So uh, these plants are grown for that primary purpose. They do have a tendency to be invasive. They can, if you get them in your garden, you can have a hard time getting rid of them. Native Brassicaceae, one uh, pretty common one in the Des Moines area is toothwort. You can find these in about any woodland. Uh, most of the Des Moines parks have these uh, early spring. You can get quite a carpet of them. Sweet little flower. Uh, another one is spring cress, cardamine bulbosa, which you find more in wetter areas. People sometimes use it in when they're going to have uh, egg and cress sandwiches. It's kind of a common European food, but some people use it for that purpose here. A non-native brassicaceae that's in Iowa, unfortunately, is garlic mustard. This is one of our most obnoxious invasive species. You can see that picture on the bottom. The garlic mustard has, is everything green you see in that photograph. It has completely taken over the understory in this woodland. And when it does that, it shades out everything that was going to grow there, the little tooth warts that you saw a couple pictures back, and anything else that uh, had been native on that understory is now uh, smothered with lack of light. And additionally, sometimes it puts out some kind of unpleasant chemicals that uh, helps, uh, uh, helps reduce other plants' ability to grow also. 
The upper picture is the flower and the close-up of the leaf. It does taste like garlic. It was brought here intentionally as a garden herb. In the spring, uh, I've made, more than once, made garlic mustard pesto from uh, folks helping me pull garlic mustard out of parks and places where it shouldn't be. It is a biennial, so if you keep at pulling it and don't let it set seed in a given area, you can reduce the population to the point where there's only a few, and then uh, if you keep up on it for those stray seeds, it will germinate you know, years after they've been on the ground. Uh, it's possible to get rid of it. It can be very daunting, though, when you have acres of woodlands that are um, have a heavy infestation, and it definitely in Des Moines we have a serious problem. It is just everywhere. Uh, in the upper picture also, I should point out, you can see in the flowers, like the flower in the lower right, has a little thing poking out, poking out of it. That is the salik beginning to develop as the flower matures. Let's see. And then also another problem with this that, that helps make it invasive is that each plant produces thousands of seeds. So anytime you let even one plant go, uh, it very quickly can um, have your population back up to problem levels. Another non-native brassica in Brassicaceae species in Iowa is Dame's Rocket. This plant is attractive, and it's been sold commercially. People buy wildflower in a can, mixes, and, and sometimes just buy this uh, separately, and uh, not realizing that they're kind of letting the worms out of the can. It um, can be very aggressive. I've seen it spreading in ditches in the last five years uh, quite aggressively uh, in Polk County. You can see a picture of a woodland there where it's been spreading. And also um, on the left is just a wetter area. It doesn't mind a little moisture, so you do see it in ditches more than as in a lot of plants. Uh, and then the bottom right, you can see the salix sil developing, and they're kind of got some lumps in them, so they are like a low mint. Toxicity, dose makes the poison. The same compound that gives the, the attractive flavor to broccolis and mustards and all of those uh, plants in the family that we eat is toxic at high doses. They are generally called, they're generally glucosinolate compounds, which is glucose, six carbon structure with different amino acids attached to it, and they're hooked by a sulfur atom. And that sulfur is uh, the source of the smell and the taste uh, when it breaks down to isothiocyanates uh, after the cells have been crushed. Uh, this is not the source of mustard gas, but mustard gas has a, a vague resemblance to that odor, which is why it got labeled mustard gas. And probably the uh, production, whenever a plant's going to go through the hassle of making a, a plant, uh, a compound this complicated, there's going to be a reason for it because that's going to be an energetic um, a use of energy for the plant. And it probably evolved to deter, deter insect populations, insect predation. But sure enough, insects being what they are, they have co-evolved in turn with these plants so that some of the insects that are very focused on Brassicaceae, whether they're um, sucking the sap or eating the, the leaves, have specialized systems so that they can break down those glucosinolates without them being toxic. So um, kind of um, like warfare, you keep b building bigger weapons and then the other guy figures out how to build an even bigger weapon. So that is um, uh, about all the toxicity issues that there are with Brassicaceae. Uh, little links for more information. Of course, there's Wikipedia. There's the horseradish homepage. Arabidopsis, as I said, they have. Uh, there's numerous Arabidopsis pages. And if you want an excuse to travel to the UK, there's a watercress festival every spring over in uh, the Anglia area. So put that on your bucket list. That's the Brassicaceae.